uh, Halifa Saleh said uh, earlier, uh, just a week ago, uh, Yahya Jame went on national television. He conceded defeat to President-elect Adama Barrow. Before the election, he said uh, it would be the most transparent election in the history of the world, that Gambia's elections were, in his words, rig-proof. Uh, and then a week later, he, he does a complete U-turn on election results that were not only affirmed by Gambia's own electoral commission, they were affirmed by the economic community of West African states and the African Union. So this election has been universally accepted, universally affirmed, uh, except for in the mind of Yahya Jame himself. I think several factors are at play here. I think, uh, number one, a key issue here is there's very clearly uh, some fear uh, within Yahya Jame himself about being prosecuted for the myriad crimes he has committed uh, over the course of two decades. And I think um, perhaps the opposition, some in the opposition, made a blunder in that regard in terms of making that public before the transition had officially taken place. Secondly, I think uh, th there's very, very clearly something happening within the military. I don't think uh, outgoing President Jame would make the statement that he did, saying that the election was somehow rigged uh, against him if he did not have s at least some support in the military. Interestingly, on the day that he announced uh, the U-turn, the day before actually, he had promoted uh, 49 senior members of the military. It was a big story in, in the local media. So perhaps there's something going on there in the media. But I think first and foremost, he, he did have uh, quite a scare put into him by a lot of the rhetoric being thrown around okay. uh, about him being well, potentially prosecuted. Let, let's, let's bring in Mutala Toure then. Uh, um, uh, former senior analyst at uh, IHS, an independent analyst now in West Africa. Mutala, um, uh, could Jammer's announcement have been prompted by the prospect of prosecution under under the new uh, under a new government? Did the opposition blunder? Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, first of all, uh, we must take into account that what is happening in Gambia is unprecedented. It's the first time something like this is happening. So there is no experience about how to go to go about this uh, peaceful, uh, peacefully and then also uh, we should bear in mind that um, uh, president elect Adam Barrow didn't win with absolute majority uh, he won by 45% uh, so currently Gambia is a divided uh, country and that should be taken into consideration and i think uh, some of the uh, the factors that uh, uh, drove Jame to make a u turn uh, it's as well just after he considered defeat uh, because Gambia didn't have this kind of experience before, people went to the street jubilating, thinking that Jame, the next day, he's out of power, and then we're having a new president. So uh, there, there was a, a lot of uh, some destruction, bringing down his, uh, his images, uh, his posters that are leaded all over the country, and then uh, there were some kind of uh, um, attack, reprisal attack, house to house. And, uh, and then he himself uh, uh, conceded that um, people that we are green, that uh, green is for the, uh, the, the, party fl the party color, APRC, became, blue, uh, became yellow, which uh, is the opposition. So he became really, really scared. And then with all these uh, um, talk about him being uh, uh, held accountable, I think he's fearful that his legacy is at risk. And then uh, he's likely, like I said, uh, he's likely to spend the rest of his time in jail. So he's really, really fearful. He has his back to the wall, and and it's uh, currently it's a dangerous time in the Gambia, and uh, we've seen the rising risk of uh, interstate war, even between Gambia and Senegal, even from the rhetoric from uh, Senegal that they're going to be forceful with uh, Yahya Jammeh, that Yahya Jammeh will uh, recognize his result, okay. and then there is a likelihood of, uh, of 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 civil war. So the opposition should not rise to the bits of, of uh, President Yahya Jammeh. Yeah. They should uh, use non-violent means, and then see that uh, he hand over. Uh, come January. Je Jeffrey Smith, I mean, uh, the opposition has called for people to remain calm, lucid and, and vigilant and not to retreat. I mean, what happens if the people do take to the streets? Will, will Jama call a, st a state of emergency and, and, and what happens then? Yeah, that's that's very concerning and a, and a very good question. And I think we should all be vigilant and uh, watching what transpires in Gambia in, in the coming days. I think, you know, first and foremost, the, the really important uh, the really important factor here again is that Jame lost the election. President-elect Barrow uh, needs to needs to assume power in January, have a peaceful transition of power according to the Constitution. And on the issue of, of potential violence, even before the election, those concerns were very high. So the Early Warning Project, for instance, which is a project uh, at, the, at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, actually cited Gambia as having the fourth highest 
statistical increase in the world uh, uh, leading up to the elections in terms of the threat of, of state-led mass killing. So now with tensions rising once again, I think that is certainly an issue that we need to all be aware of. Um, importantly, uh, both the, uh, the African Union, the Economic Community of West African States, and the United Nations issued a joint statement saying that there needs to be a peaceful transition of power, that Yahya Jammeh must step down in accordance with the country's own laws. And secondly, uh, yesterday, the United, uh, the United Nations Security Council unanimously uh, declared the same, all 15 member states, which is very important. So the world is watching, uh, and, and I think that's very important on a situation like this, where in the past, a lot of these crimes, a lot of violence, and a lot of human rights abuses committed by Jame and the regime have gone okay. unnoticed. And that's uh, very different this time around, and I think that's incredibly important. Motala Toure, one more question on, on Jame and, and the Gambia before we widen our, uh, our discussion. Um, how did he come to lose his grip on power? I mean, did the opposition in the Gambia outsmart him, or did his jailing of the opposition leader, Husseino Dabo, uh, galvanize people against him? What happened? Yeah, I think uh, there are several uh, contributing factors to, to it. First of all, I think he was too overconfident that he, he has the, the support of the Gambia. And then before, before the election, he made uh, several changes that, has, uh, that have now come to, to haunt him. Like he changed the, uh, the, the, the electoral laws, um, uh, barring uh, Hussein Dabo from uh, running from the pres uh, for the presidency. He, he set the, the age at 65. So that's uh, one of the factors why uh, Barrow uh, came, uh, came in. And then, as, 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 as well, he changed the, 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 the law to have, instead of having uh, two-round voting, he made it one uh, simple majority. So if there had been a second round of voting, then the, probably he would have had the chance of uh, uh, allying with uh, Mama Kande. Mama Kande, who came uh, third, is a former member of the uh, APRC, so probably he would have won. So all these factors, and then with the opposition, uh, as well as the Gambian people, they've uh, had enough of uh, yeah, Jame, uh, ex excess, and as well as uh, human rights violation, p throwing people in, uh, in jail. So they were really uh, looking forward to, uh, to change. So all these contributing factors, he himself, uh, with uh, changing, uh, tinkering with the, uh, the Constitution as well as the electoral laws, uh, that's, uh, you know, brought, to, uh, brought uh, his end. Well, following the end of the so-called Cold War, democracy was thought to be flourishing across Africa. Now, though, international observers fear that democracy has stalled or is, in fact, being reversed. A number of authoritarian leaders across Africa hold an iron grip on power. Many are accused of repressing the opposition, of amending laws to extend their rule and overseeing rubber stamp elections. At least 16 African nations held elections this year. The transfer of power hasn't always been smooth or always led to representative governments. Edgar Lungu was re-elected president in Zambia in August in a poll marred by harassment of the opposition, claims of vote rigging and the closure of an independent newspaper. Disputes too in Gabon uh, following the election there in September. The opposition accused the constitutional court of a miscarriage of justice for upholding the victory of President Ali Bongo. And President Yawari Museveni of Uganda extended his 30-year rule earlier this year in an election which international observers condemned as a sham. Jeffrey Smith, I mean, what does it take to make a positive political transition uh, in Africa possible? I think uh, that's one of the tragic, uh, one of the tragic outcomes of, of the Gambia. The election result there that was announced on December 2nd, uh, in which it was announced that now President-elect Adama Barrow had ousted one of the continent's longest-serving dictators. Uh, it provided hope not only to Gambians, but people across the region, across the region and across sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, now with this reversal, again, it puts into flux the, the state of democracy uh, in the region and dashes the hopes of, of millions uh, across the region. I think if you look more broadly, one of the really interesting aspects uh, in sub-Saharan Africa is the fact that poll after poll shows that Af citizens across the continent uh, prefer electoral democracy uh, over, over the alternatives. What is missing, however, is the supply of democracy. So the demand is increasingly high, the hopes and aspirations of people remain high, but the supply of democracy uh, remains woefully low. If you look at um, Freedom House studies, for instance, uh, only 12% of citizens uh, in sub-Saharan Africa live in a country in which democratic ideals, civil liberties, and political rights are actually protected uh, in, in practice, which is very concerning. And I think 
t- looking at West Africa in particular, in which uh, Gambia is situated, uh, there has been tremendous advancements, uh, in my opinion, in terms of advancing democracy. We saw what happened in Ghana just um, just this week with uh, the opposition candidates ousting the incumbent president, and we know there'll be a peaceful transfer of power there. So in West Africa, specifically, uh, tremendous advancements being made. And again, Gambia is making headlines for all the wrong reasons and is really a veritable black eye on a region otherwise doing very well. Uh, Matala Toure, we talked about... Uh the UN Security Council, the African Union and, and ECHO was, the, the UN Security Council says Juma must hand over power without conditional delay. The African Union described his statement as null and void. Um, are the AU or, or ECHO was competent bodies when it comes to the democratic transfer of power in Africa? ECHO was, uh, we've seen increasingly uh, making uh, some a very uh, strong uh, progress in terms of uh, uh, pushing for uh, stable uh, government and uh, democratic uh, transition. Uh, we, we we saw um, what they did in Mali in 2012 when there was a, a coup. They, they they stepped in, um, then prevailed on the military to hand over to uh, a civilian-led uh, transition. And uh, the, the military, they didn't even stay for a month. We saw the same thing in Burkina Faso um, last year when the, the military wanted to, to, to disrupt the uh, peaceful uh, transition. They stepped in as well in, uh, in Guinea-Bissau. So they've had this uh, experience. And I think with that, uh, one can say, uh, probably with arguably, that uh, the, the military regime in West Africa, their days are numbered. Uh, in the sense that you can make a, you can stage a coup, but you won't be allowed to stay in uh, in power. I think that's a tremendous uh, progress from the part of uh, ECOWAS. So now ECOWAS, they do have uh, this experience. They have uh, leverage. They have uh, people that can get uh, to Yaya Jame. One of uh, these uh, strong men, I think, uh, it's former president of Nigeria. That's uh, Olusegun Obasanjo. Uh, he has uh, some levers over Yaya Jame. He's somebody, some, somebody, some of these people that should be brought in and put this pressure on Yaya Jame from now to this, at the end of December or to, uh, January so that he can see a reason to hand over power peacefully. Uh, uh, Jeffrey Smith, um, uh, the average age of Gambia's population is, is 20. Um, many people there have known no other leader. I mean, uh, uh, and that demographic is, is repeated right across West Africa and, and other parts of, uh, of the continent. Um, you say demand for democracy is high. To what extent may we see a, a sort of African version of the, the, the Arab Spring with people demanding uh, democracy, proper, true democracy? Yeah, I, I think certainly, as, as we were talking about previously, the demand for democracy uh, continues to rise. And I think the, the Arab Spring analogy is a bit uh, overplayed here. I think there's certainly different social and, and cultural dynamics at play uh, in sub-Saharan Africa that were otherwise uh, evident uh, in North Africa and parts of, of the Middle East. But one of the concerns here, and, you know, pivoting back to, to Gambia a bit, um, is, is the rising tension and the rising frustrations of people who in Gambia, for instance, went out and stood in line and bravely voted out uh, one of the continents and, and arguably one of the world's most repressive dictators. They literally put their lives on the line to do this. And now that that has been taken away, uh, so social tensions uh, will certainly increase. Uh, and, and one of the big fears there, too, is that Jame, over the past 22 years, has become an expert at dividing people. He has divided people along, certainly along political lines, along ethnic lines. Uh, for instance, before the elections, he threatened to bury uh, the opposition nine feet deep. Those were his own words. He threatened to kill uh, the Mandinka ethnic group, which makes up about 40% of Gambia's population, threatening to kill them like vermin. He called them ants. So sort of conjuring uh, this very very horrible rhetoric that we saw in the early 1990s in Rwanda before the genocide happened there. And I'm not saying a genocide yeah. uh, is imminent in the and Gambia, but these are certainly big concerns um, that uh, are not only a okay. concern for Gambia and for the region, uh, but certainly for, for the United States and other vested shareholders in Gambia's future. Gentlemen, there we must end it. Many thanks indeed for being with us, uh, Jeffrey Smith and Butala Toure. And thank you, as always, for watching. Don't forget you can see the program again anytime just by going to aljazeera.com. 
And for further discussion, join us at our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter at AJ Inside Story. From me, AJ.